I start this? This started off as a, as a short presentation to our History Society back in, uh, up in Ilkeston about a year and a half ago at the start of the commemorations for the Great War. started off as a short presentation uh, and then one or two folks said, well, you ought to expand it. It could make a good t uh, talk. So anyway, I spent a lot of time researching and digging and delving and, and so on. And this is what you're going to get. Terror from the skies, the January 1916 raids, the night the Zeppelins came. Now, it does contain, I must warn you, descriptions of injuries and also photographs of a few dead people. It also contains a large lump of my usual quirky humour, so hopefully you'll understand what I'm talking about. And also some marvellous, marvellous animation, because I spent hours doing this. I hope you'll appreciate it. <laughs> Honestly. Right, now the first question is, and if you do know the answer, keep stum, because I might have told one or two people, what is the connection between Coleman's mustard and the Zeppelin raids of the First World War? I shall tell you at the end of the presentation. Right, now of course the Zeppelin gets its name from this man, the man who invented them and designed them, Ferdinand Adolf Heinrich August Graf von Zeppelin, but to save time I'll just call him von Zeppelin, otherwise we could be all here all night. Um, born in 1838, died in 1917, died during the First World War, when his Zeppelins of course were being used. As a young man, <coughs> He'd witnessed uh, airships or uh, balloons being used in the Union Army during the American Civil War. He went as an observer from the Prussian Army, went there as an observer. And this is what people used to do in those days. People from other nations would join uh, an army that was on campaign to observe and to learn and look at the way the people would uh, develop in tactics and weapons and so on. Not as spies, but just as observers. And they then, of course, would take those ideas back to the country their own countries. Zeppelin, in this case, witnessed, as I say, airships, or rather balloons, being used uh, on campaign by the Union Army. Now, these were, of course, very important. Uh, this was a very important development, because, of course, if you could see over the hills and see over the woods to see what was going on a couple of miles away, that gave you an advantage over the enemy. You could see where they were coming from, where they were going to, and so on. Now, the Americans developed this idea using uh, a gas, which you all know of, called helium. But when Zeppelin went back, when von Zeppelin returned to Germany after the uh, uh, American Civil War, he started to put his ideas into action, using, of course, the family's vast wealth, because they were a very, very wealthy Prussian family, and started to develop the idea. Uh, after a few faltering starts, had the maiden flight of his, well, the flight of his first successful Zeppelin, the LZ-1 in 1900, but the problem was they had to use hydrogen because America was the only place that you could get helium from and uh, the Americans imposed an, emb an embargo on the export of helium gas to other countries. So the Germans had to use the next best thing, which although lighter than helium, which of course is the gas that you use in balloons today and that makes your voice go squeaky if you breathe it in, which is always great fun. I'm not suggesting you do, but I always do. I can't resist it. Um, they have to use hydrogen, which, as say, is lighter than helium, but, as you all know, is incredibly inflammable. Incredibly inflammable. And, and of course, I suppose many of you have actually seen film of the, uh, the uh, Graf Zeppelin in the 1930s that went up in New York, went up in seconds. Absolute conflagration. Now, the size of these things, there is... Trying to work out how big these things are and, and get it across to people it was a bit tricky. Now, the Zeppelin that came over this area in 1916 was one of nine Zeppelins that were on, involved in this raid. They were absolutely colossal. I mean, you, most of you know our big St Mary's Churches, which is a large church at 160 feet in length. But the type of Zeppelin that flew over Ilkeston and this area in 1916 were almost 600 feet in length, and they weren't the biggest ones that were, were built. Uh, last year, I think it was last year, I phoned my friend Danny Corns up. I says, uh, are you doing anything tomorrow morning? No, 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 I've got nothing to do. Right, join me on the marketplace. We'll measure Ilkeston Marketplace and see how big it compares to a Zeppelin of this size. So anyway, he stood in front of the library. Long tape measure. I'm sort of going out with a bit of 100 feet, chalk it off. A bit for 100 feet, chalk it off. And he said, it can't be as big as this, it can't be as big as this. Another room's of people. We got to the market inn on the other side, we ran out of space. Now, of course, being in Ilkeston, you get gawped at. 
people stood there with their mouths open, you know, like, come on, one or two, come on. They said, what are you doing? And of course, we uh, fiendishly told them that we were measuring the marketplace out to see if you could land an airship in it. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't tell them anything else. And we knew very well they'd be nipping into the pub saying, you won't believe what we've just heard. There's going to be an airship, Bob Wilson. So in the end, we ended up turning ourselves around and going from in front of the Warren to the end of Anchor Row. 585 feet. As I say, that wasn't the biggest Zeppelin that we used in the First World War. And I think the, I think the, the, uh, the Hindenburg, uh, oh, it was the Hindenburg that blew up, uh, was about 100 feet bigger. Again, put it into context, if you could park a Zeppelin of this size in Lincoln Cathedral, and I'm sure many of you have seen Lincoln Cathedral, Litchfield Cathedral, the average cathedral, about 485 feet in length, you would have 100 feet of that sticking out the other end, because it still would not be big enough to contain it. It's difficult to imagine how big these things were. There's a, an artist's impression. <laughs> what are you laughing at? That's real, that is. <coughs> I don't know what street it is, but that just gives you an idea of what these things were like, hovering over the towns and cities, and, and uh, sort of like coming out of the clouds and so on. Absolutely enormous. Now, I won't get too technical, but uh, the rate that they could travel up to 3,000 miles, they would only travel at about 55 miles an hour. Their engines were actually no more powerful than one of those 1950s Ford Pop engines. So not very powerful engines. So they relied on clear skies and tailwinds to get them where they wanted to go. They could carry up to about, uh, about 9,000 pounds of bombs. I think that's about three tons of bombs. Uh, and so on, crew of about 16 or 18, depending on where they were going to, and so on and so forth. <coughs> I've already given one talk this morning, so I'm running low on throat. The bomb loads a mixture of uh, high explosives, a lot of incendiaries, of course, and of course these were new, so quite often they didn't go off. So this is why some of them uh, were rest uh, collected, you see them in museums and places like that. And of course, if what, what, when these things did go off, the local populace would rush to get, see if they could get all the fragments of bomb or splinters of shrapnel and so on. But if you could go to school the next day with a piece of Zeppelin shrapnel, God, you, uh, you were well in with your mates, honestly. And no doubt that was the same in the Second World War. And as I say, these bombs, some of them never went off. And uh, of course, were recovered and appear in various museums. I think these two pictures, one, I think one's from the Imperial War Museum, this is one from Hull. Now, it did occur to me when I was putting this together that, uh, of course, the name Zeppelin, the name, it's, it's a hard-sounding name, isn't it? The same as, same as Heinkel and Junker. It suggests something aggressive, <coughs> very Prussian-sounding name, very aggressive. So, of course, you know, the term Zeppelin suggests something aggressive, heavy and lumbering and, and threatening. This is why the rock band chose the name Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin, for the band, because it, it projected something big and awesome. But it occurred to me that uh, perhaps if, if von Zeppelin hadn't have invented the Zeppelin, or the airship, because it wouldn't have been called a Zeppelin if he hadn't have invented the Zeppelin, what if, say, a Yorkshireman that had invented it? Would it have had the same effect? Tell me what you think. <laughs> it, it just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't feel threatening, does it? You know, man, there's an oller in shore, offering of a staple, but uh, never mind that. Coming in there, your bread and dripping, and all that. Sort of thing. It doesn't quite. Uh, it doesn't have the same threatening sort of feel to it. Now, the start of the First World War, August 1914. Of course, the government expected Zeppelin raids almost immediately, but they didn't happen. The reason being that mainly because the Kaiser himself was very reluctant to sanction air raids over Britain, especially over London. Because, of course, we remember that Queen Victoria was his grandmother. King George V, who was on the throne at the time, was also his cousin. And, of course, to say Kaiser Wilhelm was rather reluctant. This is why he was reluctant to sanction it. Um, and to say the, uh, the, uh, the government expected raids... Introduced immediately introduced uh, restrictions on the press, and uh, you know, but like it says there, no person by word of mouth or in writing spread reports likely to cause alarm or disaffection amongst the forces or the civil population. So when you read the newspaper articles that were printed days after these raids, the same applies all over the country. They're never specific because they might mention a church in Derbyshire 
or a hospital in Lancashire, or a factory in Lincolnshire, but they never actually say where it was. But you, with a bit of research, you can work out what the, what the targets were they were talking about. But then, of course, people didn't have the sort of information available that we have today, computers and radio and TV and that's that and the other. So they relied on what the newspapers told them, and the newspapers told them very, very little. You read the newspapers, for instance, of the first day, the reports in the newspapers on the first day of the Somme, anybody would think we'd won and overrun the Germans. But it was only later that the public realised that they'd been lied to because, of course, we all know what happened in those instances. Now, the head of the uh, German Imperial German Navy uh, Airship Division, because these airships were naval vessels. They would have had uh, commanders, uh, captains that are the equivalent of naval commanders, uh, they would have had a bosun, they'd have had a steersman. The man who repaired the gas bags inside was a sailmaker. And they were all naval uh, personnel. The head of the Imperial German fleet was Captain Peter Strasser. And he said, as it says there, I believe England can be overcome by means of airships. The country will be deprived of the means of existence through the increasing destruction of cities, factories and dockyards. Airships offer a means of ending the war. Talk about misguided. But my goodness, doesn't he look Prussian, eh? <laughs> doesn't he? He looks Prussian. Now, the bases that these Zeppelins were uh, uh, sort of established at, they, they were constructed at Friedrichshaven. Uh, they were based along the North German coast and uh, part of what is now Denmark, but was then in 1914-15 part of Germany because in the 1850s or 60s, Prussia went to war against Denmark and seized a portion of its land. And effectively, that, that upper part there that used to be Denmark and is today was at the time German uh, territory. But the bases were at Tondern, Nordholz and Haag. I hope I'm pronouncing those right. And the Zeppelins that came over on that particular night, 31st of January, as I say, there were nine Zeppelins. And uh, for uh, your entertainment, they're all colour-coded. It's clever, isn't it? Eh? Wait till you see the animation. <laughs> I'm over impressed with it. Took me hours to do. It drove me nuts because I kept getting it wrong and having to start all over again. Uh, but this is where the bases were. Say on the North German coast, there. So four there and various other zeppelins uh, there, and also <coughs> at Tonda. Sorry, at Tondern, two other zeppelins. The one that will concern us mainly in this story is the L20 which is the one that came over Ilkeston, also bombed Loughborough, and later on in the evening, Burton upon Trent. Again, to get an idea of how big these places were, I mean, if you've seen the uh, airship shed uh, that housed the R100, the R101, you know, they're absolutely colossal structures for these things. And uh, as I say, it just gives you an idea. It's difficult to imagine. I mean, these things, I think, were three times the length of a jumbo jet or something like that and you know you can imagine how big they are now the first raids over England or Britain uh, the first attacks actually weren't by zeppelins or aircraft they were by German naval vessels sailing up the east coast and bombarding Hartley Pool trying to shoot at Hall, Scunthorpe and various other places were struck by German shells fired from German ships but the first Zeppelin raids on England came in January 1915, and the first victims were Yarmouth and Kings Lynn. The, uh, the um, German uh, military, who were, of course were the ones that were in control of Germany by this time, not the Kaiser, even though he was the head of the German state, he was being told <coughs> what to do by the military, and they did convince him that uh, they promised him that they would not attack civilian targets. They would only target factories and dockyards and shipping and stuff like that, but of course, the generals knew very well that there was no way of accurately targeting particular buildings from, from even just a few thousand feet up. It was impossible. I mean, in the Second World War, I mean, it was even, I mean, if they got within two miles of a target, that was considered a decent shot from a, a bomber. I mean, nowadays, I mean, we, we watch in wonder when we're watching reports of uh, ISIS or Iraq or Afghanistan, you see a bomb, you know, land on somebody's car because they know that person's driving the car and they can direct the bomb to it. In those days it was completely different. No GPS or sat navs or anything like that for guiding the zeppelins over the targets. You just had to rely on what you could see beneath you. <coughs> Finally the uh, Kaiser 
uh, relents and allows bombing of London, again believing that the Zeppelin pilots would be aiming at the docks and the factories and the ships on the Thames, but of course it's the city itself that gets struck. But of course they don't tell the Kaiser this, they just simply report that they did hit targets in London and so on. Uh, but as I say, by 1915 really it wasn't the Kaiser that was in control of the war. In fact, I don't think anybody was in control of the war. There were eyewitness statements, of course, as there are many of these. We saw the Zeppelin above us, high up like a bright gold finger. Then there were flashes near the ground and a shaking noise. There was war in heaven, I can't get over it. Any idea who wrote that? He was in London at the time, he's a local bloke. He was in London at the time and he wrote a letter to his friend back in Eastwood describing what he'd seen in 1915. And this description of a bright gold finger uh, refers to the yellowish sort of paint, the, uh, the, the material, the um, uh, treatment that they put on the, uh, the fabric to these zeppelins in certain lights would have made it look silver or gold up in the sky, of course. And that, say, D.H. Lawrence was in London at the time and wrote that letter back to his friend in uh, um, Eastwood. Now, getting back at the Germans, because, of course, this was the first time that the public had experienced attacks on them. I mean, their, their, their husbands, sons, sweethearts, boyfriends and fiancés were fighting in the trenches on the Western Front or at Gallipoli or wherever. This was the war coming home to them. They had no idea what this would be like. They were reading reports in the papers of what their soldiers were experiencing up to a point because of censorship. But there was no way we could fight back. At the start of the Zeppelin raids, Britain only had something like 32 anti-aircraft guns in the whole of the country, most of which were just upturned field guns pointed upwards to the sky, and only one of those, which happened to be a French gun, was capable of reaching the height that the Zeppelins flew at. So really, our defences were non-existent to start with. Aeroplanes were sent up to try and shoot them down, but it didn't matter how many bullets they fired into them, of course, it just simply punctured the gas bags. It did not ignite the heat, uh, the hydrogen. That comes a bit later in the war. So people started to strike back when they read reports of women and children being killed. The only way they could fight back to start with was by attacking German named businesses. And this happened all over the country. It's terrible, really, because these people were, were as British as you and me are. They just happened to have German sounding names. Now, my grandfather, he joined up when he was 17, underage, in 1915, February 1915, joined the Leicester Regiment. His surname was Sturman. Now, that doesn't sound very English to me. And I just wonder if he had he experienced any sort of, like, suspicious looks. You know, the fact that he'd got a German-sounding name. He wasn't German. He was uh, more Dutch than anything. But it just sounds, uh, you know, this is how people react. They see a funny name, so they respond. In this picture, so, uh, some people attacking, a group of people looting and attacking a shop in Liverpool. Notice how big those policemen are. Look at them, they're enormous, aren't they? They're like kids nowadays, you know, about, about that big, aren't they? They're, <laughs> they're old, looks rattle around on the reds, poor thing. I feel sorry for them sometimes. But this is the only way they could fight back. The press could help by poking fun at the Germans, and in this cartoon, of course, they're having a go at the Germans because of the futility, really, of the Zeppelin attacks. Uh, bearing in mind, of course, we imposed a, a blockade on Germany right from day one of the First World War, blocking off food supplies, and the nation started to run out of food fairly quickly because, of course, the armed forces had first call on the food supplies. The child is asking the official, what are we celebrating? And he says, because our Zeppelins have conquered Britain, England. But the child, of course, is hungry and says, well, yes, but do we get any more bread? And, of course, the official says, don't be silly, just wave your flag and, be, you know, cheer the fact that we've been bombing England sort of thing. So, <coughs> but what we're fighting back, then you could tug at the heartstrings. Of course, the mother's lying there, covered up on the hospital bed. The doctor and nurse could do nothing to help. And the little girl's asking Daddy, but, you know, what did Mummy do wrong? You know, why is she dead sort of thing. So yeah, they're, they're tugging at people's heartstrings. And this would inspire, no doubt inspire people to think, well, you know, I'm going to join up. I'm going to fight back. And, and this was why it was done. It was all part of this propaganda program that the government was able to run. You could, have, you could of course, warn the public. I love this. Don't buy German tyres. 
<laughs> you think you won't be able to buy German tyres in time of war, but you could. Uh, trade went on, <clears throat> you know, war doesn't get in the way of business, it continues even if we're at war with somebody. Because it warns you there that if you were buying German tyres, you could be supporting the industry that provides the rubber that covers the Zeppelin fabrics, the, the gas bags and the uh, Zeppelin skin. So buy British, buy British tyres instead of German tyres. Um, this thing about buying things and selling things to countries that you're at war with was quite common then. The British Army bought thousands upon thousands of German field glasses during the First World War because theirs were better than ours. So they bought tens of thousands of Zeiss binoculars to give to our British soldiers through an agent in Switzerland. So the money went to Germany and it was our government doing it. It seems bonkers. One example which I've never forgotten after hearing this old soldier interviewed in the 1970s about his experiences on the Somme told a story and I've never forgotten it. He says when he disembarked with his mates at uh, Calais or Dunkirk in order to make their way down to the Western Front, get ready for the Somme Offensive of July 1916, all the equipment and all the soldiers were being unloaded off the ships on the dockside. He says further up the dockside, he said, I can remember seeing bags and bags and bags of blue circle cement being unloaded from the ships onto the docks. He says, months later, when we broke into the German pillboxes and dugouts on the Somme that were made of concrete, what did we see? Carpets made of blue circle cement bags. <laughs> the British Blue Circle Cement Company was supplying the Germans with the concrete that enabled them to build their underground bunkers which protected the men during the bombardment on the Somme. That, to me, is a bigger war crime than anything. But it happened, simple as that. Of course, you could warn the public about how to identify a Zeppelin. I mean, I don't know what you'd be doing. You'd be stood there saying, well, is it British or is it German or French or whatever? <laughs> uh, uh, well, we're going to have a cup of tea and have a bit later, a look later. Uh, but again, a way of sort of involving the public. You know, you can help by spotting a Zeppelin, report it to the local police station, and they'll pass on the information. I think from any height, you would struggle to guess what one, which one was which. And of course, the insurance company's getting on the act. It's typical, isn't it? <laughs> you know, why do, remember, your, your house policy won't cover you against Zeppelin attacks. You know, obviously, you didn't think of that when you took it out in 1912. <laughs> so there you go. So that there is, is a company offering you a little bit of extra insurance under the government scheme, you see, that if your house gets bombed, you, you, can, you can claim a bit of extra money and so on. And uh, a company not far from here in Ilkeston, uh, My Hills of Hena Road in Ilkeston, put this advert in the Ilkeston Pioneer. It appears nowhere in the Pioneer in the First World War until three days after the Zeppelin raids over Ilkeston and this area. And then they jump at the chance at offering insurance. Typical, isn't it? But there you go. Now this one, this one, I don't know whether to laugh or cry at this. This is the Daily Mail Zeppelin Fund that was started. Of course, the Daily Mail being the, a staunch rep uh, a reporter of the truth and all this sort of stuff. I love the Daily Mail because there's so much in it to read, even today. Um, they got a fund going called the Zeppelin Fund. And uh, if you were sort of like partaking in this, you could register. Of course, you had to buy the paper before you qualified. Um, it gives you different, what they would pay out in case of loss. But look carefully at what it says, right? <coughs> £300 for damage to your home, furniture and personal effects. £25 for the death of a child. <laughs> 300 quid if your furniture gets blown up. 25 quid if your, your kid gets injured. £2 per week for a total or temporary disablement of any adult. Loss of one limb, 100 quid or an eye. You had to lose one eye, you couldn't lose two eyes, you had to lose one eye to qualify for 100 quid. 200 pounds for the loss of a limb, but it's that bit that gets me. 25 pounds for a child. You know, now that's, that's the way it was sort of valued, that's how it was. Uh, as regards protection, there was no proper organised uh, uh, sort of, I, th I think there were probably air raid shelters of some sort, but in this case, this is a very rare example, as it says there, of a World War I shelter built by a chemist who was living in Scunthorpe, um, because I say Scunthorpe was, it was shelled at the start of the First World War and of course received Zeppelin attacks later, he actually built an air raid shelter for himself and his family at the back of the shop 
back in 1914-15. I just wonder if that is actually a, a protected building, because it ought to be. I know it's obviously a garage today, but it's a pit, it's, it, that, one's, that one's protected. I don't know if it is, but uh, it'd be interesting to find out. Now we come to the raid. It's the 31st of January 1916. Nine Zeppelins have been given orders to attack England <coughs> with instructions to attack Liverpool. They got nowhere near Liverpool, honestly. They go miles out, honestly. But they were instructed to attack Liverpool. Because, of course, it was an important industrial area, <coughs> docks and ships and all that sort of stuff. Each of the Zeppelins, I won't bore you over and over again by saying L this and L that or whatever, but you'll get the gist of it. Here are the people that captained those ships. And again, look at their faces, look at the way they're standing. These are, these are Prussian officers. Uh, and these would be heroes back home in, in Germany and in, in Prussia. Their pictures would appear in the newspapers. But also the people of England got to know them as well because they would hear that L20 was captained by so-and-so and the L19 was captained by so-and-so and so forth. So they would get to know the names of some of these people. That's five of them. And there's the other four. So these are the nine Zeppelins and their captains that were to take part in this raid on the 31st of January 1916. The one that will interest us is this gentleman here, Franz Stabert. Now here he is with his second in command, Lieutenant Ernst Schurlitz. I've had to learn all these words. I love it. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> Are there any Germans in the room? I have to be careful what I'm saying. In case I, well, I don't want to pronounce anything wrong. Um, so Franz Stabat again, again, look at their faces. You know, these are, you know, serious Prussian officers. I mean, I think we've got Baltic as one of our heroes, haven't we? In Blackadder. <laughs> right, it's late afternoon, Monday the 31st of January, 1916. The weather forecast is for clear skies over the North Sea and the Channel as the Zeppelins are approaching. But then they hit a bank of fog on the East Coast. And immediately, this causes problems because they've no navigational aids, no GPS. They had a rudimentary radio system where they could radio back to their base in Germany and they would relay a message back and they would work out where they were. But it was very crude and often didn't make much sense. They relied on what they could see beneath them by looking down and referring to maps. So if they saw, say, like a, a distinct coastline, say, like the Wash, they would be able to recognise that and get an idea as to where they were. Wait, for, this is good, this is, look, watch this, watch this. Look at this, watch it. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Come on in, look. I went mad at my computer doing this, it took me ages. <laughs> they immediately start to lose their bearings. In fact, one of the Zeppelins, you'll see it in a bit, the, the green one there, which is the L17, he gave up after a while and cleared off back home, he just didn't have a clue where he was. Um, but they're coming in in drips and drabs because, as I say, with these four engines that are powering these Zeppelins, quite often the, the engines didn't work properly. They might lose an engine, so that decreased the speed. Uh, side winds, head winds would blow them off course, and so on. But they were convinced that they were on the way to Liverpool. But already they're losing their bearings as they come through this bank of fog. The L15 crosses the coast near Mundersley in Norfolk, and then it's followed by the 16 and the 14. Then they start to bomb. Oops, wait a minute. The first bombs start to fall southeast of King's Lynn. Now, as I say, they got orders to raid Liverpool. Their secondary orders were that if they failed to reach Liverpool or were blown off course to choose targets they deemed to be of importance. So obviously King's Lynn was deemed important enough uh, to receive more bombs that only had been raided a year before. Well, that's the, that's the case of what's happening. But you can see what's happening, look. They're starting to wander. They ain't got a clue where they are, look. Oh, that bank of fogs moved there all of a sudden. <laughs> Technical. Look. There you are. Now, watch the green one. Look at it. I've, I've had enough of this, you said. <laughs> I don't know where I am. <laughs> it's eight o'clock now. Now, reports of the Zeppelin raid was, were, had been coming in. But again, with no radar or uh, satellite sort of uh, tracking devices in those days, things we take for granted nowadays, um, they relied on, say, fishing boats in the North Sea or naval vessels patrolling the coast. If they saw a Zeppelin coming in or a fleet of Zeppelins, they could at least radio back to their bases on the coast or at least a fishing boat could report back when they got into port that they'd seen the Zeppelins coming in at such and such a direction at such and such a time. This would be reported to the local, uh, the equivalent of the Home Guard 
uh, the police forces, and that mess those messages could then be phoned through to other places, because you know if they assume that they were heading for a certain <coughs> city like London, London could be put on alert. Now, at eight, by eight o'clock, of course, we knew that the Zeppelin raid was coming. They didn't know how many Zeppelins were involved. They just spotted Zeppelins coming in from uh, the coast. Leicester received a warning, Derby received a warning, Nottingham received a warning, but Loughborough didn't. And so its street lights were still on at 8 o'clock. The factory lights were still glowing, so it made it for an easy target. This led to stories or rumours after the raid that uh, Loughborough had not been told in order to allow the Zeppelins to use that as a target to draw them away from the bigger cities like Nottingham, Derby, Leicester and so on. Probably not true because it was just a simple error that somebody didn't get the report. I believe the report was sent through but it never reached the proper authorities. Anyway, it's 8 o'clock and the L20 reaches Loughborough. This one, the, uh, the 21, that's heading off towards Birmingham. That's about as far as the Zeppelin raids reached actually that particular night. This area, these buildings don't exist today. This is a shopping centre in the middle of Loughborough. An area then known as the Rushers, where bombs started to rain down on the houses and the businesses and the shops. At the back of the Crown and Cushion pub, and that, that is, that's the right spelling apparently. And you say, you can see the damage, there's roofing thrown asunder, there's roof slates smashed, there's holes here. But of course, everybody, people have turned out to observe and see what's happened. Empress Road in Loughborough, also struck by bombs. Now there were heroes that night in Loughborough. The case of Ernest Morris and, uh, Morris and Beatrice Stubbley, both of whom were uh, decorated for their courage on that night. Ernest Morris, I think he died in 1977 or thereabouts, uh, he was seen shinning up gas lamps in the streets to extinguish the lights, to reduce the, uh, the light on the streets, and then shinning down and then running to the next one, climbing up, extinguishing the light, and so on. He received the OBE for his courage, because while he was doing this, the bombs were raining down on Loughborough. Beatrice Stubbley, she was an employee at the Empress Works. She'd left work, made her way home. She was almost home when she realised that the lights were still burning in the factory. With the bombs falling in the streets and crashing around and people running left, right and centre, she ran back to the Empress Works and switched off the electric power, reduced, you know, say, subduing the lights, switching the lights off, shutting down the machinery, warning everybody, of course, and she again was awarded for her bravery. And there they are, of course, receiving their medals from the then Duke of Rutland after the event. Of course, there are many towns that were struck by the Zeppelin raids over the war. They, of course, commemorated <coughs> it. This was a plaque that was set up uh, in Loughborough. It's now in the Charnwood Museum because the place where the bombs landed is no longer there. It's now a shopping centre. So this was taken down and is on view at the local museum. So it's 8.15. Do you want a cup of tea yet? Five minutes for a cup of, before I mash, put kettle on. Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, I'm thirsty already. <laughs> I'll have half a lager if you've got one. <laughs> you need to get a license. <laughs> it's good here. Right, here we go then. It's 8.15. Now it doesn't take long for the L20 to get from Loughborough to this area. Only a few minutes, really. It's the one in red, look. It's 8.30, or thereabouts. The L20 is attracted by the lights. We think that it was attracted by the lights of the furnaces at Benelli Ironworks, and, of course, of the railway as well. Now, whether the Zeppelin pilot, the captain, Franz Stabat, knew that he was over Ilkeston is a bit questionable, because after he bombed Benelli, and later on in the evening he bombed Stanton, he reported, well, filled in his report when he got back to base, that they bombed Sheffield because they were convinced that the light and the glow from the furnaces and the foundries was from the steel and iron works at Sheffield because as far as he was concerned, they were on the way to Liverpool. So they wouldn't be over Ilkeston, they'd be over Sheffield heading towards Liverpool. It just shows you how far out they were. As I say, the Benelli Iron Works, there used to be a number of iron works in the area in 1914. There was the Benelli Iron Works, the Gallows Inn Iron Works, and of course the Stanton Iron Works being the biggest. So the glow from these furnaces would have attracted the Zeppelins to an industrial area. They'd have seen it, and this is why I thought he was over Sheffield. 
He approaches the Benley Ironworks. He also spots, of course, the railway line, the main railway line crossing the Erewash Valley, carried, of course, by the Benley Viaduct. So that's been in the news again recently, being restored as a, as a, as a cycle path or whatever. Uh, this originally, of course, brought the railway that you'd have caught from Victoria, Nottingham, Victoria, towards Derby Friargate, bringing you over the Erewash Valley. Anyway, the bomb started to fall. One landed on the signal box, destroying it, or very, very badly damaging it. Another bomb tore up some of the railway tracks, damaged some of the sleepers. Another bomb brought down the telegraph poles and the telephone wires. But within three days, this had all been repaired. So it's a really futile attack when you think of it. You know, the amount of energy expended and men and manpower and equipment just to tear up railway lines that were repaired a few days later. But that's how it was. Um, the signalman, nobody was killed at Benley, although the signalman, I assume, was shaken, if not greatly stirred by the bomb landing on his <laughs> signal box. But as I say, it was only a matter of days before he was back in action. The Zeppelin then turns round and starts to head back towards Ilkeston. At the very moment of the attack, the people of Ilkeston were enjoying a performance of a new play. At the outbreak of the First World War, there was a rush to produce plays that had propaganda in them or spy themes and this other. A bit like a second-rate Agatha Christie, third-rate Agatha Christie sort of a theme. People of Ilchester were enjoying a performance of The Enemy in Our Midst, a story that was set in a stately home and amongst the gathered family, one of them was a German spy. Of course, it figures, doesn't it? And of course, the audience had to work out who the spy was, a bit like a mousetrap Agatha Christie sort of a jolly. By sheer coincidence, the play also featured a Zeppelin attack, complete with the then rudimentary sound effects. So while the audience are sat watching the enemy in our midst, enjoying the sound effects and the lighting effects of a Zeppelin attack, there's an actual Zeppelin attack <laughs> taking place outside the theatre, more or less. So, of course, people rush into the theatre to say that the banging and thumping that you can hear is outside as well, not just on the stage. So then, of course, people come out of the theatre, flood out of the theatre and start to make their way to uh, their, their homes and so on, while at the same time looking up and watching the Zeppelin coming over Ilkeston. Now, as I say, there were eyewitness reports... Uh, there were eyewitness reports that suggest that there was more than one Zeppelin uh, over the area. And sorry, the, 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 the L-20 was going backwards and forwards. There was another Zeppelin in the area, the L-14, which flew near West Allen. So could have, could have, would have been seen from Ilkeston. And this is why people reported that they'd seen the Zeppelin go that way, then go that way, then go that way, and so on. They were probably seeing one or two or possibly even three different Zeppelins at different times. Now, for those of you that don't know, Vince Theatre used to be on Had uh, Lord Haddon Road. It was built in the 1890s, very cleverly built with 1,999 seats in it. Because if you had a theatre with 2,000 seats in it, you paid a tax on every seat. So you built it with one seat short of a 2,000. <laughs> uh, very clever. Tax evasion was just as rife then as it is today. Now, the L20 now, uh, is tea ready? Yes. Right, okay, I'll stop now then. I'll leave you in suspense. Continue. Right, it's 8.30. Of course it's dark, I presume it was dark in January 1916, unless it got different time zones or whatever. The L20 is now approaching Ilkeston. It heads over Trowel and it drops a couple of bombs, demolishing a cow shed and killing the cow therein. <laughs> Can we have a bigger arm than that? <laughs> um, Daisy, <laughs> so we're led to believe. Uh, I don't know if this society will uh, run to a plaque in memory of Daisy. <laughs> it would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> there you go. Anyway, so now it's uh, a couple of bombs on trowel. I gather that one of the shell crater, bomb craters is still just visible today, uh, but was certainly visible when uh, Danny was a youngster some hundred odd years ago um, <laughs> he's timeless honestly yeah. um, it reaches Stanton again attracted by the glow from the blast furnaces because these were the old open top furnaces that spewed their flames and ashes into the air and so you couldn't miss seeing them so anyway the L20 is now attacking Stanton 
Bombs start to fall. There's 15 bombs dropped across Stanton. It seems negligible by later standards when they dropped tens of thousands during the Second World War. But of course, it's a big attack on Stanton. The first bombs strike in an area known as the, uh, the Old Works on Lowe's Lane. The main office block, that's still there today, had its windows blown in. Um, there was uh, the truck shop, the fitting shop, blacksmith shop, were all struck by bombs. And there was one fatality at the Old Works. The Zeppelin then heads towards Hallam Fields. St Bartholomew's Church at the top of Crompton Street, or Crompton Road as it is today, the building still stands, although no longer a place of worship. It's uh, owned by a, a, an electric, a railway electrical company as their premises. But the bombs start to fall, and one of them strikes the parish room at the back of the church. It shatters the east window, it peppers the wall with shrapnel, and the marks are still visible on the east wall, of St. Uh, of, uh, St Bartholomew's today. It was never repaired, you can still see the pot marks of where the shrapnel and fragments struck. About 30 minutes before the bomb landed and destroyed the parish room, the vicar's wife, Mrs Cox, had been looking after some young girls, some 30 young girls, the Girls' Brigade or Girls' Guild or whatever it was in 1916. 30 young girls. She'd invited them back to the parish room for a supper. But at the last minute, and we gather it's because she didn't feel very well, she changed her mind and invited them back to the vicarage, about 500 yards further up the road, for the supper, instead of in the parish room. Now again, it's one of those moments you just think, what if? You know, what if, why did she make that decision? She wouldn't have known about the Zeppelin overhead because it was still 30 minutes away. <coughs> but it's just one of those weird things that happens. If they'd have gone that way, if they'd have gone this way, what would have happened and so on. Anyway, the bomb strikes the parish room, totally demolishing it. It was repaired, however, within about six months, the Stanton Brickies had got in there and repaired it and it was back in use because, of course, this was an example of German frightfulness. This is what the newspapers would say. They will say the Germans, uh, suggested the Germans had deliberately targeted a place of worship or a hospital or a school or something like that. And of course it was an example of German, I love the phrase, German frightfulness. <laughs> frightfulness. It wasn't, it was hit and miss. Anyway, this is the room being repaired. As I say, the window was shattered. Fragments of the glass were collected. The East Window of St. Hall Hallenfield's uh, Church, which was then reconstituted into this memorial uh, sort of little window, which is now at the Erie Wash Museum. And of course, fragments of the bomb were collected as people rushed down to Allen Fields in the morning after to gather up pieces, to look at the damage. They reckon hundreds flocked from Ilkeston down to Allen Fields to see the results of the raid. The 50p, of course, was not dropped by the Zeppelin. <laughs> That's just their precise comparison. <laughs> And obviously, somebody picked up a fragment of the, uh, the shrapnel, probably, possibly, a uh, Stanton blacksmith, heated it up in his forge and hammered it into this German cross, the Maltese cross shape, to commemorate the raid of Hallam Fields, 31st of January, 1916. Again, that is in the... Uh, no, that's not the museum, that's in a, uh, private hands today. Now, as I say, there were two deaths. I'm surprised there weren't more. The man you see on the left-hand side, his name was Walter Wilson. This photograph was taken in June 1914, so it's about a year and a half before the raid of the 31st of January 1916. Here he is photographed with his friends, his mates working down at the new works, or the Hallam Fields works, on the furnaces. Their job was to load up these wagons, these barrows with iron ore, coke and limestone, and to push them into the furnaces to keep the furnaces charged. He'd finished his shift, probably about quarter past eight, twenty past eight, clocked out and was making his way up Hallamfields Road from the furnaces near the Eriwash Canal to the tram stop on Hallamfields Road, intended to catch a tram back to his house at Station Road at Ilkeston. He hears the bombs dropping or he sees the Zeppelin overhead and decides to cross the road and hide behind the church wall just as the bomb strikes the parish room. He's struck in the back by a piece of shrapnel. He's taken to Wilkinson Hospital, but sadly dies the following day, 1st of February, leaving a wife and a number of children. The gentleman you see on the far end eventually married his widow, 
and brought up the children as his own. His name was William Rowley. We only heard that fact last week, last Monday, when we unveiled the plaque at Allen Fields Church, when the great nephew of Walter Wilson said it was William Rowley who married Walter Wilson's widow. Anyway, it's just a case of, had he been somewhere, if he'd have stayed on the other side of the road waiting for the tram, he'd have survived. But it's just, again, one of those things. The other fellow that was killed was James Hall. Killed outright when he was struck in the head with a piece of, well, either a piece of shrapnel or a fragment of iron thrown up by the bomb exploded. He was killed outright, and as it says there, killed instantly, instantly while at work at the Stanton Iron Works through the explosion of a bomb discharged by a hostile aircraft. Now, he was living, as you can see there, at number 12, Homer Cottage, Frederick Road, which is just round the corner, just there. As I say, he was killed outright. Be careful what I'm saying, because there are relatives in the audience today of uh, James Hall. And uh, as I say, he was struck in the head. He was conveyed to the doctors at Little Hallam Hill. At a, he used to live at a place called uh, Brooklands. Brooklands, wasn't it, Danny? Brooklands? Yeah, yeah. Brooklands. The big house on Hall uh, Little Hallam Hill, where the doctor used to live. And the son of the doctor later on wrote down his memories, or told his memories of that night, of seeing this poor chap brought in with the head injuries, dead of course, and the boy, he says, as a boy, he was fascinated by this, you know, seeing a man with such injuries. Uh, his father, however, being the doctor, passed out at the sight of it. So some doctor he was. <laughs> now, I say, James Hall was actually buried, he's buried at Stapleford uh, Churchyard. Uh, Walter Wilson, I've got to find out where he was buried, but anyway, his name, his name is actually included amongst those on the cenotaph on Ilkeston Marketplace of the dead of Ilkeston, the people of Ilkeston who gave their lives during the Great War. Even though he wasn't a soldier killed in action, he was still deemed to have been killed by enemy action, and so his name, W. Wilson, you'll see it on the bronze plaque on the cenotaph on Ilkeston Marketplace. There you go, it's just a case of where you were at the wrong time and so on. Well, eyewitness accounts, this is of the Ilkeston raid. The, great, the whole area was in great consternation with women and children running about wailing and crying. It appeared so low it could have been easily shot with a rifle. And the heads of the crew were clearly visible in the gondola. The Zeppelin, the Zeppelin slowly made off and returned later in the evening to bomb Stanton Ironworks. And the following morning all of Ilkeston visited Hallenfields to view the bomb craters and I came away with a fragment of bomb casing. Imagine him showing that to his mates the next day at school. Crikey. All the girls would have been right round him straight away, honestly. With a piece of piece of Zeppelin shrapnel in your hands, you'd have been a star. The Zeppelin circled over Stanton and then flew towards the furnaces at Bentley, some six miles away, where it dropped more bombs before heading for Stanton again. Again, this is an eyewitness report. It's not quite right because he's just going on what he remembered. Time and again this procedure went on. The old works truck shop was struck and the windows on the front of the general officers were also blown in. Witness when he was about 17, Jack Whitworth of Allen Fields. Of course, the advertiser reported on the, uh, the raid, and uh, in order to raise morale, the next morning a pigeon coat was found partially wrecked with its side and end gone. But the pigeons, being British, <laughs> remained in blissful ignorance of the danger which had threatened them and was now passed, uh, thankfully passed. Um, I don't know if they interviewed the pigeons at all, but uh, you can imagine what they would have said. I'll just have a drink of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you realise, of course, I take this all very seriously. <laughs> now, there is an eyewitness statement, and I've gone and left my eyewitness statement at home. Um, this is actually written by uh, a lady by the name of Oh, Mary Charlton, she lived at uh, Chilwell Hall with her husband Geoffrey, he was a local justice of the peace, a member of the Charlton family, a very important family uh, in the area in those days, and they lived at Chilwell Hall, and she wrote to her sister uh, down south, her sister Catherine, talking about the raid, and the bit, if I can remember it rightly, but I should be able to learn it by now, is that she writes and describes that at about 8.30 she, they heard a bang and a whizzing sound and she thought it was a motorbike to start with and then the local bobby came and told him to turn the lights out because there were zeppelins in the area then she writes that she went down to the lodge to gather up the servants and the belgian refugees these were refugees of course that came over when the germans invaded belgium in 1914 
And she says, then I put them down the cellar and things like that. And then she finishes off by saying, and then I pushed Geoffrey out the front door. <laughs> well, poor Geoffrey, uh, what, what's wrong with the cellar for him? But there you go. But yes, this is the actual letter written there. Dearest Catherine, you will be, uh, etc., etc. You'll be interested to hear about our, ad our adventures with the Zeps last night. And, and last Monday night, because of course it was on a Monday that the raid took place. Right, now the L20 now turns towards Burn on Trent, believing that it was in Liverpool, or over Liverpool, because the, apparently when they reported the filled in the log books, they said they could see the Mersey beneath them and both sides of Liverpool either side. I'm sure the people of Burn on Trent were pretty flattered to be <laughs> compared with Liverpool, bearing in mind that the Trent is nothing like the Mersey, but again, they didn't know where they were. It bombs Burn on Trent. Bombs started to fall. Possibly the most serious damage was done to a number of breweries. <laughs> Imagine that. Absolute disaster. Uh, as I say, there were injuries, there were deaths, I'm afraid, and, and quite a few injuries at Burn on, on Trent. But again, there's the humorous side of it. This is what an eyewitness says. Suddenly, the force of an explosion caused the window of a Dale Street butcher shop to shatter, and a large portion of black money was blown into the middle of the road. In those days, money was scarce, and meals often frugal, who we feasted like kings for a week. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That is from, a, from a, a, an eyewitness statement at the time uh, in, in, in Bur on a new Burton on Trent newspaper. Again, you know, it just makes you picture the situation, can't you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it took me ages to superimpose that back and come back picture. <laughs> More likely to be a Frankfurter, to my darling. <laughs> right, let's get back to seriousness. Right, it's nine o'clock. The all clears, not, not the all clear is sounded, but they say they, the, the towns and cities had had a warning at about seven o'clock in the evening of an impending Zeppelin raid. So by nine o'clock, the raids have taken place, people are relaxing, they're standing down, and so on. <coughs> Some of the Zeppelins now running low on fuel and believing they'd bombed Liverpool, apart from those that got completely lost, as you see there, start to wander around. This one, the L14 was the only one that reached anywhere near, that reached Wensbury. That's as far east, uh, far west as the Zeppelins actually got on that night. And then they start to wander around, dropping their last few bombs, and then leaving England, more or less where they came in. Not all of them, but they wander about a bit, and so on. Anyway, the L14, on returning from the West Midlands, reaches Derby. Derby, of course, had had a warning earlier in the evening, but by midnight, of course, the Zeppelin raids are over, as far as they're concerned. But the Zeppelin L14 moves in and starts to attack, dropping bombs on the Rolls-Royce works, <coughs> all near the station area. There's, uh, as I say, uh, kindly allowed to use them by the Rolls-Royce company, the shell crater there, showing the damage done. Behind Fletcher's Lace Factory, as it was in those days on Osmiston Road, three incendiary bombs. What is now Bombardier? Then, of course, it was the Midland Railway and Carriage Company. Bombs were dropped there. Five high explosive bombs, some on the nearby streets, one at Bateman Street, and five fall in the street on Horton Street. Again, not far from the railway station. So, here we go. The one, it's good in it, hey, it's good in it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> off it goes, look, off it goes. Right, now, the L19 is the last one to leave England. It's now four, past four o'clock in the morning. He's running very low on fuel and he's lost. I think one of his engines was causing trouble as well. So he wanders around a little bit, gets his bearings and heads out into the North Sea or off the channel. Now, as I say, the reports... And the reports weren't in the papers until a week later, when, of course, they would be allowed to report on what had happened. Reporting that in the raid, because there was raids in Europe at the same time, <coughs> there was 59 killed, 101 injured. This changes, of course, because news reports change a little bit when the facts are actually coming in. Uh, and so on. 300 drums, bombs dropped across six counties. So, of course, we've got Norfolk, uh, Leicestershire, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire... And, uh, of course, uh, Warwickshire are the counties that are bombed on that night. The toll that night was 10 killed in Loughborough, 
Two killed at Ilkeston, 15 at Burn upon Trent, and of course many injured. Five killed in Derby, and one woman who had a heart attack or died of shock. Uh, and the total during that raid was actually 70 people and 133 injured. A bit higher than the newspapers reported. Now here's a, a, another story, a twist in the story. The L19, which I've just mentioned a few minutes ago, running low on fuel, got engine trouble. Its captain, Otto Lowe, decides that the only thing they can do is to head out into the sea, and then finally the Zeppelin L19 comes down. It's floating in the water, the crew climb out, they are standing on top, when they see a Grimsby trawler, the King Stephen, approaching them. The captain, William Martin, has a decision to make. Does he rescue the crew and risk being overpowered because there's only about five of him on the board the trawler. There's 16 German officers and men on board the ship. They could be armed. More than likely they've got guns. So what does he do? Does he take them on board and risk being overpowered or does he leave them to, his, to their fate? The Germans plead with him to take them on board, promising as officers and gentlemen that they will not do anything to overpower them and will surrender. So he consults with his crew and his first officer on the King Stephen and they decide to draw away, leaving the crew to their fate. Before the, before the Zeppelin sinks, finally, they all write messages back to their wives and sweethearts and families, seal them in bottles and throw the bottles into the sea. Not one crew member of the L-19 was ever found. In fact, all they found of the Zeppelin itself was a half-empty fuel tank, proving that the petrol was running out when they crashed. But no bodies were ever found, but the bottles over the next few weeks started to turn up on the coast and were sent back to their families. William Martin was seen as a hero back in Grimsby, but declared a war criminal by the Germans. But as he said... He knew what the Germans had done to some of the trawlermen that they captured at the start of the First World War, sailing just a little bit too close to their ships maybe, or whatever, and they'd arrested them and even executed some of them as spies. So of course he remembers what the Germans had already done, and of course dropping bombs on the people and shelling the, the towns on that e uh, east coast at the start of the war from warships and so on. They say that it troubled him for the rest of his life. He, he died still traumatised by this decision. Should he have taken these Germans on board or left them to the fate? And as I say, damned if you do, damned if you don't. What would he have done? What would you have done? It's a split second decision, but that was a decision he made. And he died still troubled by that thought that he'd left them men to die. Now, Captain Franz Stabbert... He got home okay, because out of all the Zeppelins, the nine Zeppelins, eight of them returned home. Only the 19 failed to get home, as you saw, was crashed. He came to uh, sort of like grief a few months later in May 1916, when again the L20 that he was the captain of came down off Stavanger near, in Norway, off the coast of Norway, brought down by a French anti-aircraft gun on board a French ship. It ditched, all the crew survived. They were all captured by the Norwegian authorities and imprisoned. Now, the Zeppelin that came down, well, of course, was uh, when these things came down, that people would flock to the site to grab a bit of the material or something like that as a souvenir. We would do that today. I'm sure we would. This is the Zeppelin L20 when it crashed. This is the same Zeppelin after the souvenir hunters had had it. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they would cut bits of the fabric off and this and the other. And pieces of this fabric, uh, it's like a rubberized sort of canvas. Uh, you still see examples in museums around the country today. Imperial War Museum have got some and so on. Uh, as I say, the crew were captured along with Stabbert and uh, his second in command, Sherlitz, imprisoned, but Stabbert escaped. In fact, I think most of the, uh, the crew escaped. Uh, no, yeah, he, he escaped. I don't know how many of the crew did. Made his way back to Germany and rejoined his fleet. The report of the loss of the L20, not reported in British newspapers, but in the Daily News Perth, Western Australia. Soon after the event, I think it came down on the 4th of May, or thereabouts, and it was reported <coughs> on the 5th. And it reports about the L20 coming down and so on. Some of the facts are not quite right, but that's, you know, down to newspapers and so on. And it states there that he only had 10 pints of petrol left when the coast was sighted, then he was brought down and so on. 
A year later, the L44, on which Captain Stabbert is actually the captain now because he's lost the L20. This is on a mission in the east of France. It's brought down by anti-aircraft fire and it crashes to earth. It catches fire, bursts into flames, of course, and of course, with all that hydrogen on board, there's no chance of survival. And there is, uh, unfortunately, one of the crew mangled up amongst all the wreckage. And there is Franz Stabbert lying on the floor with the wreckage of the L-20 behind him. But that's the cost of war. <coughs> now, Sherlitz is second in command during the raids over Ilkeston and Lord Brun Burn on Trent on the 31st of January 1916, um, survived the war. He came down in September 1916 when he was the second in command on board the L-33. Came down at Little Wigborough in Essex. Now, I gave this talk a few months ago, and an old gentleman came to me, and he says, where did that Zeppelin come down? Because he says, my father was there when that Zeppelin came down, and was one of the people that went to see it and tried to, tried to tear a bit of this fabric away as a souvenir. I said, little Wigborough in Essex, and he says, that's the place, that's the place. Again, I love it when somebody comes to me with a story like that. Anyway, the L, this is a, now there's an element of Dad's army in this. The L-33 comes down. The crew all survive. They jump out. And what they do, first of all, is to ignite the hydrogen so that they can destroy the Zeppelin so it can't fall into British hands. They then gather themselves together and formulate a plan. They know more or less where they are, so if they can make their way to the coast, they can then steal a boat and get back to Germany, rejoin the fleet and continue the war. So they're walking down a lane. This is absolutely true. They're walking down a country lane and they run into a local bobby, armed with a bicycle, a lamp and a truncheon. <laughs> and they ask him, the Germans ask him for directions to Colchester. He realises, of course, that they're not local and arrests them. One policeman, 16 German officers and men, he arrests them. March, they give themselves up. He marches them to the local police station. They phone up the local uh, army chaps. They come and arrest them. And Sherlitz spent the rest of the war at Donington Hall, which housed German officers during the First World War. But would you ask, would you ask a local Bobby for directions to Colchester <laughs> if you were planning? As I say, you can just imagine what this Bobby must have thought. There's 16 of them, and there's one of them with a truncheon and a bicycle lamp or something. But he manages to arrest them. I must find out his name. And there, of course, it is. It shows you how close they were to the coast. But all they have to do is say, get their intention was to reach Colchester, nick a boat, and then sail across the sea. But the bobby rumbled them. Now, the costume to the Germans, this is a bit like something from Henry VIII, isn't it? Died, survived, died, survived, survived, died. These are all the captains of the ships on that night in 1916. Survived, died, died, of course, I mentioned that one, and died. Those Zeppelins that had taken place, it was very costly for the Germans, and, and by 19, uh, late 1916, uh, the British had developed an incendiary bullet that would ignite when it uh, flew through the air and would strike the Zeppelins, igniting the hydrogen in the gas bags, bringing them down relatively easily. And so in 1917, they scrapped the idea of using Zeppelins for raids and went over to sending aeroplanes over Britain, British cities, and using that means. But most of the Zeppelins that had taken place in that raid in 1916 were lost anyway. The cost during the war as a whole, negligible compared with the Second World War, but of course this was the First World War, uh, 557 killed during Zeppelin raids, but far more by aircraft. 1,300 injured, more than that by aircraft. The Germans lost nine Zeppelins, 70 officers, 250 of the ranks, and 150 were captured or wounded during the war. Sherlitz remained in the, uh, even though he was captured, he was released in 1919, returned to the German Navy, and during the interwar years, of course, Hitler rose to power. He became a vice admiral in the German Navy, and during the Second World War was put in charge of the U-boat uh, um, bases at La Rochelle. In 1944, with following the uh, invasion of Normandy, of course, La Rochelle was uh, being approached by the British and the Allies and so on. But during the war, during the, the uh, sort of, uh, many German officers knew that the war was lost. And uh, Sherlitz <coughs> made an arrangement. 
unknowns to his superiors, of course, otherwise he'd have been shot. But he made an arrangement with a French officer, or a French uh, commander, who would have taken over the base once the Allies had won as they were approaching, made secret arrangements with Hubert Mayer that uh, if the Germans surrendered peacefully, the French would look after them and treat them well. That was agreed to. Unfortunately, the Allies didn't get that message, and they still bombed it anyway, killing many Germans in the process. Uh, but Shirley survived the war. He didn't die until 1977, I think it was. But there you go. Now, as you many of you will have seen, uh, last Monday morning, uh, we, we yesterday, the Ilkeston District Local Listener Society unveiled one of its uh, new plaques. We've uh, it's set up three or four so far. This is the next one. This was the next one commemorating the raid. There used to be a plaque on the wall at Allen Fields, but that was taken down some years ago, and I believe it did have the wrong information on it. But this commemorated, this is what it says on that uh, nice stone plaque with gold lettering. And being terribly lazy, I haven't included a photograph of the actual plaque. So I've had a week to do it, but I just didn't get around to it. On January 31st, 1916, this building was hit by one of several bombs dropped across the Stanton Iron Works by the Zeppelin L20. Two men died that night, James Hall and Walter Wilson, and it was the great nephew of Walter Wilson, Fred Wilson, who we invited to unveil the plaque last Monday. Those of you that would have seen it on uh, East Midlands Today saw, what, a minute's article? We were there two hours filming. We were frozen. We went over and over things. Danny knows what I'm talking about. We went over and over things, and they narrow it down to about a minute's worth of stuff. And as soon as the article came on, he kept saying steel workers at Stanton, at the steel works. I kept shouting at the telly, it's iron, it's iron works. Yeah. But there you go. Now, I bet you've been pondering over this, haven't you? Right, now if you do know the answer, don't shout it out. If you think, you know, well, you know what I mean, if you've seen me do this and you know the answer, keep stum. Anybody got an idea what the connection is between the Coleman's Mustard Company and the Zeppelin raids of the First World War? Any suggestions? Oh, come on, there's got to be one. I've had mustard gas, um, uh, Norwich, which of course was yeah, yeah. It's near struck. No, it's none of those. Just let me take a gulp of coffee. Must be Daisy. <laughs> right. This was obviously produced as a promotional gimmick because, um, you know, people like Coleman's and others would have sort of jumped on the bandwagon and thought, well, we can do something that promotes our products but claims to be helping people. Coleman's came out with this, and it's the only example of one that I know of. It's glued into the back of a young boy's no, uh, exercise book in the First World War, in which this young 15-year-old kept notes of what he's heard on the, seen in the newspapers and heard on the streets about what was going on. And this is, in fact, the Coleman Zeppelin Raid Indicator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, the original, it's, it's actually about six inches across, quite small. I mean, uh, one, two, three, four, about six different circles there held together in the middle with a pin. The idea being that you would get this, you would look at the weather, is it a full moon or is it a half moon or is it cloudy or foggy, and you would move the wheels into a position which would then tell you whether a Zeppelin raid was probable, <laughs> possible, or very improbable. Instructions on the back. Um, the original one is quite tatty, I've actually done, done quite a lot of work on my computer to restore the colours and get the get the uh, sort of the dirt and the muck off it sort of thing. I'm going to make one of those and see if it works. <laughs> because if it tells me there's no Zeppelin raid likely and one doesn't happen, there's proof. <laughs> so thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah. If any questions, please yeah. fire away. I don't, I don't know how I'll get away with it. <laughs> well, I'm sure we've all enjoyed it immensely, particularly the personal bits about the people and the places, which brings everything uh, to life. It has been a fascinating talk. 
Stephen, really, really. Thank Stephen. you very much. I know yeah. everybody's enjoyed it, and lovely to have uh, so many, so many male, male visitors on our. <laughs> Machines, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to thank you very much indeed for a fascinating evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> are, are there any questions? I just ask one, Steve. Yep. You know, some of us have not worked out yet. Just perhaps put your mind to this one. All the all the offices look Prussian, don't they? And they probably were Prussian. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, as you know, I've been to the engine sheds and the Zeppelin Museum at Friedrich Hall in a couple of times. Uh -huh. But it's in the middle of nowhere, outside of Lake Concrete in Lower Bavaria. Uh -huh. Why are they there, not in Hamburg? Oh, look at the time! The mass from Hamburg, is it because of remoteness, perhaps, and building these things? Maybe. Have... There, there was uh, the RAF, or the, the, the RF, oh, RFC oh, yeah. as it was, mm. the fledgling uh, Royal Air Force, did it did attempt to raid on the Zeppelin works where they were building them. Oh, my. Oh, I know. Um, they flew from... I mean, it was all bodged. To, it was all a, a disaster in the end anyway. Uh, but it was an attempt. I think they flew, first of all, to, to one neutral country. Then they flew, I think, to yeah. Switzerland or something. <laughs> and then they set off again, but got lost. Yeah. Came down, were captured, this, that and the other. But uh, there is an account of a raid on the... Yeah. Uh, and because on the raid, on the, on the, where they made them. But because they were so far away, they had to hop from one country to another. And probably had little chance of getting back anyway because no, they really didn't find you know, Far enough know. away, yeah, yeah. yeah. That'll find out. Another yeah, thing yeah. I've got to check on then. <laughs> Any more? I'm rather told them everything, all they're baffled. <laughs> <laughs> Baffled by that uh, Coleman's mustard thing. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? It's true. It's true. I'm going to make one. I'm going to make one. I'm going to make a big one and take it with me. Have a look at the weather outside, then we'll, we'll move it. See what happens. <laughs>